Good evening. Margaret Bourke Wyatt's photographs documented the history of her times, 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Why did she photograph the inside of the steel factory in the 1920s? How did she happen to be the first Western photographer allowed in Russia in the 1930s? How did she become the first accredited female photographer during World War II, embedded with the troops in Italy, going on bombing missions? And how did she capture the gentleness of the Mahatma Gandhi shortly before his death, hired as the first female photographer for both Fortune and Life magazines, Bork White brought us the photo essay. Entire news stories were told through her crisp black and white photos. A terminal illness shortened the career of this brilliant photojournalist. Now, actor, educator, Sally Matson brings this fearless woman back to life. Here is Margaret Bourke White in the late 1950s as she looks back on her adventurous career. 1936, and I'm going to be working for Life magazine. So I've already been working for Fortune for five years, but now Life is sending me to New Deal, Montana to photograph the Fort Peck Dam. Now, New Deal is a, is a frontier town. It, it looks like a movie set. It's not even there anymore. And everybody was, you know, there were welders and engineers. There were quack doctors and fancy ladies. Everyone went to the bar X at night. The bartender put her baby on the bar. And I sent all these shots back to New York, and Life sent me a telegram and said, what are you doing? I said, don't worry, I'm taking plenty of shots of the Fort Peck construction. Here is the uh, diversion tunnel, for instance. These are the diversion tunnels where the water will go through. And then I was awarded the inaugural cover of Life magazine, November 23, 1936, the Fort Peck Dam. Then they sent me to the Arctic tundra to accompany the Governor General of Canada as he was going about on a steamship, you know, meeting his constituents. And at one of the first stops, somebody came on board and said, does this telegram suit anyone on your ship? Honey Child, Arctic Circle, Canada, I love you, I miss you, Erskine. Well, that was Erskine Caldwell. We had written a book together about southern shower croppers. And then the next stop, Honey Child, Arctic Circle, Canada, why can't you come home and marry me? <laughs> you know, we had been through this often. The very secret of life for me was to maintain in the midst of rushing events an inner tranquility. I had chosen a life that dealt with excitement, tragedy, mass calamities. I needed a sense of serenity as a kind of balance. I couldn't have somebody asking me to come home every minute. And then Mrs. Roosevelt, the First Lady, invited me to the White House to photograph the entire family at Christmas time, and she sent the most charming note afterwards. Artist, genius, wonder woman. I have never seen such pictures. They are really extraordinary. I hope we didn't wear you out, everyone firing questions at top speed. Do come and see us again when you have time to spare and we can just sit around. Sincerely yours, Eleanor B. Roosevelt. Well, I have to ask you, do you think anyone ever had time? Do you think Miss Roosevelt ever had time to just sit around? I doubt it. Oh, 1937, they sent me to Louisville for the Great Flood. I had the last plane in, and I hitchhiked on a rowboat. Well, what happened was, the Ohio River had overflowed its banks. All of the people in the low-lying areas had lost everything. And I came upon this food line. Now these billboards, hundreds of them, were all across the country. It's amazing. 
this was supposed to be about the Louisville flood, but it became a marker. It became a marker of the depression. It turns out the American Association of Manufacturers was putting up these billboards, trying to tell everyone everything is fine, but it was the depression. <laughs> Dorothea Lang and other photographers went around looking for these ironic situations. So while we were facing the depression, Europeans were facing growing war clouds. Erskine and I went over to Czechoslovakia. We were going to write another book together, and we came upon this photo. Now, you know, this is thousands of people saying Heil Hitler. This is Bohemia, Czechoslovakia. And these are Sudeten Germans being whipped up into believing that they are a repressed minority. In this land of readers, the bookstores are closing, the newspapers are vanishing. The superb liberated theater of Prague has been ordered to close. Well, Erskine and I went across the country now. We eluded our escorts, and I was arrested. You know, I always had two cameras around my neck and my old favorite speed graphic. Well, we got out of that and came back and wrote North of the Danube, telling about these growing steps toward war. And then you're going to think I'm crazy, but I actually married Erskine. I figured if I married him, maybe he wouldn't be so desperate to be with me every minute. But he had to sign my contract, which said he would try to control his mood swings and he would not attempt to take me away from my assignments. <laughs> 1941. Now the Nazis and the Russians had signed a non-aggression pact, but my editor was sure the Nazis were going to break that pact. They wanted me in Moscow before any other journalist. Well, Erskine came along. We were going to, uh, he had his own reporting to do, actually. They wanted me in Moscow. So we couldn't go through Europe. We had to go all the way around through Russia. Took 30 days to get across Russia. And then we landed in Moscow, across from the Kremlin, just as this firing began. The Nazis bombing the Kremlin. It was spectacular. It was gorgeous. And it was so loud, you just wanted to cower in the subways, but I did not do that. This was my job. I had five cameras, 22 lenses, 3,000 peanut flash bulbs, and all of my developing equipment. We had films hanging all over the hotel room. You know, what I really wanted to do, though, this whole time was to photograph Stalin. So finally, it was arranged by Roosevelt's envoy. I walked in. There was Stalin. He was shorter than I thought and all pockmarked. Not at all what you see on these giant posters all over the country. I said, would you like to sit down? Nothing. Um, I said, remember, I photographed your mother in the early 30s. And the, uh, the interpreter said, your mother, your very mother. Nothing. So I gathered up my equipment, and I was just getting ready and dropped this whole pile of bubble flash bulbs on the floor. And as I was crawling around picking those up, he burst out laughing. So I turned around, got my camera, and was able to get this shot with just this bit of a smirk still on his face. Well, 1942, we were in the war now. Life sent me to Britain to photograph our B-17s as they came across from the United States. Erskine and I were having uh, great to-dos. We had many, many, many tempests. But you know, I have always thought work is something you can count on. It is a lifelong friend that never deserts you. So I asked General Doolittle if I could go on a bombing mission. He said, no, you can't go on a bombing mission. That's too dangerous. You can go on a troop ship. So here I was on my way to Africa with 6,000 British and American troops, 400 nurses who envied my pants. I had my first accredited Army Air Force uniform on and the first five WACs. 
there were, there were people saying maybe we were going to be torpedoed. And then one night we were. I grabbed my bag, threw out all my clothes, put in my Linhoff and my Roloflex cameras, rolls of film, my best lenses. I had my life belt over my shoulder, a helmet on my head. Everybody was very calm. We had been through this twice a day. Got into lifeboat number 12, which was half filled with water from the torpedoing. And then when we got down in the water, it was violently rough. And and we realized our rudder was broken. All of the other ships in the flotilla moved away. They didn't want to bring attention to us. People were bailing with their helmets. They were sick in their helmets. One of the other lifeboats capsized, and we took, a, took in a nurse with a broken leg. I think this is really the only time I ever was afraid. One uh, lifeboat went by in the dark, and they were singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies. And then in, in the morning, um, a British plane went by, and people waved, and I got out my cameras. So we were saved. And who's the first person I see on land but Jimmy Doolittle, General Doolittle? And he said, Maggie, you want to go on a bombing mission? I said, you know I do. I'm not going to quit asking. So suddenly, here I am in a secret spot in the Sahara. I had lost everything on the ship. The Signal Corps loaned me this high-altitude flight suit and the K-20 camera for aerial shots. You know, the Signal Corps also told me, don't take off your electric mittens over 15,000 feet or you'll lose your hands. <laughs> well. There are 10 men on a bombing mission. It's very tight. It's very nerve-wracking. Brigadier General Atkinson was climbing and diving and swerving. I was used to that from aerial photography. It wasn't until we came back I realized we were being shot at. Well, the mission was a success. We bombed a German airfield in Tunis, Tunisia. <laughs>